So as we come to this um, lengthy section, um, we're going to quickly move through the events. There are really four different events that we're going to see here. And um, uh, each one, I think, does point us towards, um, towards Jesus in a real uh, beautiful and, and wonderful way. Um, the first event that we're going to look at is the plotting of the chief priests and the scribes. We can see that in verses uh, 1 and 2. It says that it was two days before the Passover and the Feast of Unleavened Bread, and the chief priests and the scribes were seeking how to arrest him by stealth and kill him. For they said, not during the feast, lest there be an uproar from the people. Uh, Jesus spending this past week in the city of Jerusalem was a very, very polarizing figure. Um, Jesus, what, there's a, a verse as Jesus was walking towards Jerusalem, a couple chapters back, and it says that as he was walking towards Jerusalem, some people were encouraged and some people were afraid. Something about Jesus drew out uh, opposites and polarities in people. Some people felt more brave seeing Jesus. Some people felt scared by looking at Jesus. And here, as Jesus is continuing to teach and act in and around the temple, some people are drawing out more, more love and commitments to him. And some are, are drawing more and more hatred towards Jesus. And here we see this discussion, this plan that's being made of, well, let's just, let's kill him. We will make plans to kill him. It's not a matter of if. They're only deciding a matter of when. When will we kill him? So this whole, these whole 25 verses that we'll be looking at, they really are a matter of, of looking at people who love Jesus, and then they act on that love. And we're also going to see people who hate Jesus and then act on that hate. So it's a real kind of polarities, two, two different opposites and extremes we see here. So now we look at that first event, and now we contrast it to a second event. And this event happened, well, I'll read the event and then we'll talk about it. Verse 3 down to verse 9. While he was at Bethany in the house of Simon the leper, as he was reclining at table, a woman came in with an alabaster flask of ointment of pure nard, very costly. And she broke the flask and poured it all over his head. And there were some who said among themselves indignantly, Why was this ointment wasted like that? For this ointment could have been sold for more than 300 denarii and given to the poor. And they scolded her. Jesus said, Leave her alone. Why do you trouble her? She has done a beautiful thing for me. For you always have the poor with you. And whenever you want, you can do good for them. But you shall not always have me. She has done what she could. She has anointed me for burial. And truly I say to you, wherever the gospel is proclaimed in the whole world, what she has done will be told in memory of her. So this second event that we're going to spend a few more minutes on, than we looked at the first event, is Jesus being anointed in Bethany. And as I mentioned that the first event happened on Tuesday night, it seems like what's happening here is a flashback to what happened last Saturday. Uh, I'll, I'll explain why. Uh, John chapter 12, the, the Gospel of John tells these same stories, but it tells them in a really chronological order. John describes this event as happening right before, the day before Jesus got on the donkey and entered into Jerusalem on Palm Sunday, or the triumphal entry. Uh, Mark tells it out of chronological order. I think he does this to heighten the emotional weight of what happens next. Does Mark do this um, on other occasions? Yes, he does. It's one of the ways Mark tells stories. He, he does a flashback, and in the flashback, brings you, brings something to mind, and then he tells you what happens next, so you really feel the full emotional weight of it. Sorry, Mark describes what happened to Jesus a few days ago. Um, John tells it in chrono chronological order, and chapter 11 and 12 talk about how Jesus went to the town of Bethany, and there he was greeted with the very sad news that his other friend Lazarus had died of natural causes. And his sisters, Mary and Martha, are so sad that their brother had died. And Jesus asks, he inquires, well, where did they bury him? And he goes out and then he says, Lazarus, come forth. 
and Lazarus comes out of the grave. And then John chapter 12 says, and they have a party afterwards. They have a big meal, a celebration, they have a banquet. They celebrate the fact that the brother was dead, but now he is alive. And then they have this celebration. And I believe this is what Jesus, sorry, Mark, is um, referring back to here in this passage. You, you see it there. It says that while he was at Bethany, in the house of Simon the leper, he was reclining at the table. So this, this celebration is taking place. Uh, Mary is there, Martha is there, uh, Lazarus is there, and Simon the leper is there. We don't know who Simon the leper is, except the fact that he is not a leper anymore. If he still was a leper, he would have been unclean and outside of the village of Bethany. The fact that we're in his house and he's there means that he's been healed. The fact that he's been healed of leprosy makes me suppose that Jesus was the one that healed him. So and then we read about this, this woman who, Mark doesn't give us his name, but her name, but, but John's Gospel tells us this is Mary, the sister of Lazarus. She comes in and she just, in an extravagant, worshipful act, anoints Jesus. There's this worship of Jesus, there's this appreciation of who he is. And I just, I just picture it, I, I think through the people that are there, and I just think, man, I wish I could have been there. What a wonderful, exciting, joyful, happy meal. But, but in a sense, <coughs> that's happening right now. In, in a sense, in a slightly smaller sense, that happens every Sunday as we gather together. We, who were, Ephesians 2 says, we were dead in our transgressions and sins. But we have been made alive in Christ. Ephesians 2 also says that we were strangers and foreigners of the promises of Israel. We were unclean. We were unable to come into the promises and the blessings of God. But, but Jesus has made us clean. And then he brings us in. And we come together to, to worship him. We come together to say that he's our honored guest, that he's our master and our Lord. And so we read this where Jesus is honored by those that had been dead, but now we're alive. Jesus is treasured by those that had been unclean and excluded, but now brought in. We see that, that people in gratitude pour out their worship before him. Well, every Sunday, we do the same thing on a smaller level. Again, uh, we're talking about the, the contrast that we see in this chapter. And we just saw the first event as we saw the chief priests and the scribes. And they are, in a sense, conspiring together in secret as to how they can kill Jesus, how they can harm him. And then here we see Mary kind of excuse herself from the table, and she is nearly conspiring in secret how she can honor Jesus. And she has a love for Jesus that's motivating her towards actions. 